to Sullivan here in Philadelphia. Uh, I thought that we would get two videos in one. Um, number one, this video is brought to you in part by Shriners Iris Gardens out in Oregon, who sent me a gorgeous assortment of bearded, tall bearded iris flowers to make an arrangement with. I thought we could make a design together and sort of catch up on some things that are going on. Thank you so much to Shriners Iris Garden for sending me these 12 stems of assorted bearded iris. Um, they are one of the three suppliers that I have a ton of iris rhizomes from. Um, some of you may have um, even one because they did a big give giveaway last summer when I got all my iris in. But um, iris was the collection that I added to my garden last year. I picked out a lot of unusual shades, shades that I find challenging to find in the wider commercial flower market. I'll put some details up and you can certainly check out their website. Um, I like to order flowers in their bloom season. Um, I know that sounds like super compulsive and maybe a little far reaching, but if you've had any trouble sourcing bulbs in the last year, um, you might want to get on your bulb orders sooner rather than later since things sell out really quickly. And the same for the iris, I feel like the best way to decide if you want to add a flower to your garden is to see it blooming. So that's the same for peonies, for iris. So my own iris just started blooming. I think where they are out in Oregon, their season's probably two to three weeks earlier. Um, none of my tall beardeds have started. Most of my little guys or intermediates have started to bloom. But the other thing that I'm excited about is that I got iris that I don't really have. Now, the one thing I'll say is I'm sure it's challenging for them to manage the variety of stems that they send, but I do think it would be cool to know what these guys are. In fact, I'm probably gonna go through their whole website to find out what this one's called. So there is a whole language around bearded iris flowers. Um, besides the anatomical parts of the flower, there are a lot of different ways to describe color patterns and things like that. I do not have enough experience yet to accurately describe the color pattern. So what I'll try to do is there's a couple that I really love. So I'm going to go through their website and see if I can figure out maybe a couple options that are similar to it. And then we'll just make a pretty arrangement <laughs> and we'll see. I have, um, it's been a little while since I did like a full studio setup and one of the cats is trying to eat the microphone cords. So we'll see what happens. I have designed with bearded iris flowers in the past. Um, they're usually something that I would consider a large and interesting accent element because they are so delicate and they have so many components to the flower form, you kind of want to put them someplace where they can shine. They are not a flower that you can kind of cram into a vase like a rose or even like something like a peony or an alia that's going to take up a lot of space in the vase. So when looking around at the vase shelves, <clears throat> I thought that one design that might be kind of interesting to do would be kind of a shallow bowl with a flower frog. Let me show you perhaps a footprint of what I'm talking about. Um, but I, I don't have any frogs right now. So this is a little small. This is one of uh, the first porcelain, uh, this is stoneware, but this is one of my first ceramic pieces that I made. That's definitely a little low and small for this, but save to this piece but with a frog and just a handful of shorter blooms maybe breaking the stalk into multiple pieces this could be pretty cool so what you would want is a flower frog which I will put a picture up of I just don't have any right now then in terms of scale this is a bowl that um, is a work in progress for me uh, I made it by hand, I'm not a great hand builder. So it's a little bit odd, but I think this concept has potential. And so again, what you could probably even do is something like, what I would likely do is a small cylinder in here rather than foam. I'm trying extremely hard not to design any vessels that require foam, but B 
because it is so shallow, you're going to want to use something like a three or four inch version of a cylinder. So this is just a simple, but this I think is something to maybe revisit later in the month when more of my own iris bloom. I think I would like to try making something with them in this just because I, I think it's a really interesting piece. Make sure you can see. Okay. This is a cylinder I made. I think I was doing some glaze experiments on it. That would certainly be easy enough. Maybe I can try doing something with this with if there's any little broken bits or let's say I take off something like this lower one, um, that might work for that. And I did, you know, it's not gonna, I think if you did a design with only iris, it might feel, well, definitely feel like kind of Asian or Ikebana inspired. Uh, it would certainly have a lot of air. As you can see, the flowers have a lot of space between the blooms on the stalk. But I think we're gonna try to make this vase work. This is one of my first vases. Just washed it. It's kind of a bucket shape that I cut and twisted and pulled. And I like the negative space here to see if we can get something to fall out. <clears throat> so I've been experimenting a lot with not glazing both surfaces, the inside and the outside. Uh, with this stoneware, it definitely shows a little discoloration. You can actually sand it, but I don't have any of my sanding stuff here. It's the ceramic studio. So this vase, because of the uneven height, a piece of chicken wire is gonna make an excellent frog. And I might, I would suggest if you're using any stems as chunky as a bearded iris, you don't wanna double up the chicken wire too much or it's actually gonna get really hard to put the stems in. So this is a little big. Not quite even, I think we're gonna try using the smaller of the two pieces. So the other thing about my unfinished ceramic surfaces is that they get scratched up from chicken wire. So I'm gonna have to think about finishing them so that they don't show so much wear and tear. And you know, it's not that I'm only making arrangements in vases that I made. It's just that um, I have cleared out a lot of my storage shelves so that I could evaluate the work that I've made in my office slash studio. So my other vases are kind of hiding in the basement. And I just didn't feel like going down there. All right, so typically, if you're gonna put a lot of weight into this, um, you might put a piece of waterproof tape across this as well. I think I'm out of that too. And, uh, just didn't want to order any floral design supplies. It's Mother's Day weekend. Everybody's busy. The wholesalers are probably going nuts. So I decided not to order anything. So fresh, clean water. I actually didn't use any flower food for these guys. I uh, They came in and they were really tight. And I really needed a few of them to open up to make the arrangement. And then it's been extraordinarily chilly around here and cold and uh, chilly and cold are the same thing. They mentioned I'm recovering from a week of illness with allergies. They needed some sun, which we didn't have because it was chilly and rainy. They needed some warmth. It's pretty cold out here. <laughs> not warm outside and so I needed to let them really sit for a couple days so I changed the water a few times I uh, didn't put any food in them I just wanted to kind of treat them like any customer so you can send this 12 stems of bearded iris bouquet to anyone during bloom season from Shriners and I'm impressed I got them in on Tuesday morning and it's now several days later 
and only, you know, about half of the blooms have opened. So I think we're gonna get a good 10 days, 12 days of flowers. So the one thing about it being a surprise, this is another reason I didn't order anything. I didn't really know what the colors were when I first unwrapped them. I knew that this might have like a little bit of like a honey tone. Um, I knew that there were definitely some pale yellows. I think this two-tone blue is incredibly cool. So I didn't want to cut anything until I could get a better idea of what was here. So the only things I cut flower-wise are this Vovos tulip, which is a new tulip to me. Uh, I think it was actually new to the market this year. This is like a really faded one. Uh, that's like a week old. The stems will be a little fragile, but the bloom still looks really cool. So some fern, a little bit of blueberry, and then um, some Brunnera flowers. Actually, let me move this. All right, so I'm gonna start by just adding a little foliage to this. This is my less than waterproof tabletop. So of course I'm spilling water all over the place. <clears throat> all right, so what's been going on? Well, <clears throat> I really, really wanted to do another live garden tour last weekend and I did, but I had also scheduled, all right, so let's back up a little. If you're new here, I am a floral designer on a pandemic sabbatical and I am renovating my quarter acre. Basically, I have a clear quarter acre lot attached to my house, my garden, and I love flowers. And this year I experimented with buying flowers in plug and liner form, which means that I bought at commercial cut flower grower quantities, which means if I wanted to try one color of Lysianthus, I bought 125 plugs. And while I have a large amount of space, there is a limit to how much Lysianthus one can grow. And the areas that I had designated for Lysianthus, I definitely have too much stuff in them. So I decided that it might be nice to do something with my extra plants that would benefit something in the community. And around the same time as I was sitting there in my little greenhouse bubble, rest in peace, we'll get to that, um, I was like, I, a, a notice from my neighborhood, I live in East Mount Airy, Philadelphia, a notice came up that there was a fundraising matching goal being offered for a new community garden project, which is just a couple blocks from my house. Um, this is chocolate eupatorium foliage. A little short, they're newer plants, and I want to cut too much off of it. And so I took that to be a sign that this was what I was supposed to do. And so while my budget is definitely a little tight this year due to the lack of work from the pandemic, I knew I had plants and I could sell those plants to raise money. So I decided to email them and see if they were interested in having me do a cut flower seedling sale. They were, we had it last Saturday and uh, all total we raised a little over $700, which was amazing. And then my husband uh, offered to round it up to $800 donation, which is amazing because it's on a Philadelphia Parks and Recreation site. And they keep handing them areas on this community playground site to garden in. So they need not just infrastructure, but they need additional plants, some of which I could donate. Um, and they need volunteers and they need funds for the things that come up when you're trying to set up a new space. And also they need funds because they wanna keep the annual fee for having one of the community garden plots really low. Since we live in an income diverse neighborhood, uh, they wanted to keep it affordable. And since we live in an area with like a lot of mature trees, 
This is a place for people to grow their own produce, grow their own veggies. Um, they're putting in an, a pollinator garden. So it seemed like a really great opportunity to use my abundance of plants to raise some money and it was successful. It was, however, a lot of work and very stressful. A little bit of heuchera foliage. Um, <clears throat> You know, obviously any gardener wants to keep their plants alive. That, that's really the goal. Few people plant plants just to watch them die. However, there's an added layer of pressure, I think, when you're growing for sale. It was my first experience really doing truly like nursery, uh, nursery type of care. And so I was like stalking my seedlings constantly and all was going well until, so the sale was Saturday. All was going well. Uh, lots of healthy young plants ready to go for the seedling sale. Um, things that I specifically started to bring to the sale were thriving. And then Friday, I woke up to a high wind warning, uh, which is a little unusual for here in the Northeast. But I suppose it's been become a little more common. Uh, and we had 70 mile an hour winds whipping through our garden, which is extremely exposed since we took down trees last year and then the pandemic hit and we weren't able to replace them right away. So the seedlings got blown around. My little temporary greenhouse bubble was ripped to shreds, ripped right out of the ground. Uh, <laughs> all the loops that held it to the ground by stakes were ripped right off. Uh, it, it has blown away once, but I've never seen it so damaged. So that is trash. Uh, it just was, it was a really, really rough day around here on Friday. Fortunately, the plants that were for a good cause survived. A lot of this fern is a little bit too short. So I'm gonna try and really tuck it in there, but. It's spring, everything's still growing. And then because I wanna really try to eat blueberries this year, I didn't wanna to cut too much off of one of my blueberry plants, but this one was really pretty. So Friday was really rough. The plant survived, the bubble did not. And then at one point we heard a really, really scary cracking sound and a giant limb fell off of our tree, our sugar maple, about 70 foot sugar maple, which is the focal element in my potager garden. And so my husband who was out there with me trying to move and save plants from the wind uh, went over and a giant limb had fallen off of this tree into our driveway, did not hit our fence, didn't hit anybody's property. But when we looked up, we could see that the winds had split the upper third of this tree. And uh, it's just not going to recover. <laughs> just, you, I, it's really hard to see if I show you photos, I'll show you what it used to look like. Um, so unfortunately that tree has to come down and we have tried really hard to save this tree. Uh, sugar maples in particular in decline in our area, the climate has changed to a point where it's um, <clears throat> a little too warm for them. They don't really respond well to the summers. It's not so much that the winters have gotten so extreme, it's just that uh, they're just not used to these incredibly hot, humid, dry summers that then, you know, we have a torrential downpour. So that was a huge bummer. So let's talk about bearded iris. If you're doing something shallow, you could cut this into two pieces. 
I think this bud is going to open. Sometimes these slightly underdeveloped buds will not open, but we're going to see what we can do. So this feels a little low. This feels a little tall. I'm just going to leave it for now. So this is what I mean when I say being strategic. You don't want it too far down or it will damage. These are the falls. Those are the standards. That concludes my the knowledge that I'm confident in regarding bearded iris anatomy. So working with really large flowers and stems like this can be a little bit of a puzzle, but it's been a really long time since I've had like a super challenging arrangement. So let's see what we can do with this. Now, my thought is that both of these are gonna open. Sorry, the overhead camera, <laughs> the, the flowers are so tall, the overhead camera is gonna get hit with a flower. Uh, let's see. Oh, you guys couldn't tell me that that was facing the wrong way, which means that probably needs to get separated. All right, so we're going to put this guy aside, let that open a little. But last weekend was tough. Uh, I lost my temporary greenhouse and we now have to have a very costly tree removal done one year after we had a lot of tree work done after trying very hard to save this tree. So it is a bummer. Now in a year, 18 months of major bummers, I have perspective. I know it's not the end of the world. It has, however, kind of derailed my plans and um, what I think I can accomplish because I don't know when we'll be having the tree work done, but my gut says it's gonna take a couple weeks. And I also have to redo a significant portion of my potager garden. Uh, besides the, the wind killing the tree, it killed my arch. So I have to, I have to take out several of the beds so that the tree removal guys can come in, which means I can't plant the vegetables that have already started. So it, it's a lot of stuff, uh, a lot of moving parts. And I just feel significantly overwhelmed by what's going on. And I'm just not really sure This is partially why most of my designing videos, I don't talk. Uh, <laughs> all right. So, hi Rose. All right, this is a great stem. It has a backup bud, if this one doesn't go. And then these two will definitely open. I'm gonna crack that guy off. That is not gonna open. <clears throat> all right. So, rough week. Look, I get it. Much more difficult things going on in the world, but this is what's going on with me this week. Uh, I also have spent a ton of time outside trying to get things done and had an insane, like just awful allergy attack. So um, I get the kind of allergies that make you feel like you have the flu. 
and I really I keep telling me myself that I need to wear my mask when I'm gardening because it will help keep some of the pollen out of my face and I really need to do that but you know who wants to wear the mask even more so this is only three iris stems I have 12 it's a lot the wheels are turning and I'm thinking oh, you can't even see me because I could do a second arrangement I could switch to a larger vase the problem is that none of my foliage is particularly large and I don't want to start hacking things off the trees so we'll just keep going but it's gonna get wild all right so so the loss of the tree and the temporary greenhouse are having quite a ripple effect on my plants. So I had my dahlias that I was potting up early in my temporary greenhouse. I had, so this is a cool place for this. So this bud will stick, will come out here and this one will be high. Uh, we'll just have to see what happens with this one. My goodness. It's been a really long time since I worked with such giant flowers. <clears throat> so now I'm just going to be, I might even not even get most of my dahlias planted this year. I'm trying to plant the, the few new ones that I added, but as far as the ones that I stored, they don't look very good. It's just been like a tough week and a half, two weeks in the garden, just a few setbacks. In addition to everything that's been going on in the garden, which really has consumed me for the last couple of, well, the last year, I, I have clients, uh, we're, you know, people are getting vaccinated. We're heading back out into the world to work on weddings again. So it, it's just been a, sh a strange couple of weeks and I feel like you probably can't see me at all, but uh, I only have my tiny monitor going, so I can't really see, but I, I didn't go anywhere. I'm still back here. Uh, my goodness, there's so many more. What, what did this come off of? I had one stem that must have gotten wet during either transport. So I, what happened was it had a bud in the middle that rotted. So I cut this apart into two pieces. And I think, I think this one will work down here. is the whole reason when I design my vases I make like kind of a low point if I can for the flowers to drop out when that opens that's gonna be really pretty now when you have a stem short and chunky like this it might be slightly difficult to get it into the vase so part of the reason I like knives is because you can kind of shave them down. Oh. Yeah, I want one one cut too far.
flowers can be found generally through New York Flower Group in New York and probably one of the San Francisco wholesalers, maybe like Brandon Street or someone out there. Uh, but they have such a short season and it's really important if you're buying them that you get them when they are in this really tight stage unless your event is like the next day. It's better to get them and let them sit to open than uh, have them open too soon. Uh, if there was ever a flower that was prone to bruising and tattered petals and things like that, this, this is that flower. They're just so extraordinarily delicate once they're fully open. They're actually pretty tough in bud form. The one thing you'll see is that they can sometimes get a little banged up on the ends but for the most part, depending on the color, once that's open, it's not going to be too noticeable. I honestly don't know. I don't think this is going to be the same, but maybe. It's such a mystery what the remaining ones are. I really like this one, though. I think that's really cool and kind of you know blue and yellow is probably not my first choice for color palettes to start with but they are so prolific in uh bearded iris flowers that it's unlikely that you're gonna get if you ordered 12 a 12 stem bouquet you're gonna get something with yellow or blue or both in it and so I think by using, uh, I was glad that this kind of lavender with the bright orange popped up. I think using some blue purple based foliage helps kind of connect it. And then we'll just kind of see what happens with these. Don't know that that's gonna open this one, but we'll leave it. to feel like they're the same height. So this was probably one of the first blooms to open. There's nothing particularly wrong with it. It just looks like it's kind of on its last leg. But I think if you were to arrange these for yourself without anything other than some additional foliage, uh, it would be fun because if you keep the water fresh, you're going to get basically a different looking arrangement every day as new flowers, new blooms open on the stalks. And while it's 12 stems, I think you can see most tall beardeds have somewhere between three and nine buds per stem. I would say most of these are in the three to seven range. And so there's a lot of possibility <laughs> for flowers or for separating them into multiple arrangements. But at this point, it's kind of becoming an exercise in seeing how many I can fit in here.
if you want to help them along really gently you don't want to touch anything up here but you can start to pull back kind of bud sheath gently and that might coax Yeah, it is amazing to me because my iris this year are all first year plants. So they don't necessarily all bloom the first year, but I have had a lot of blooms on my new plants. Um, but what has been interesting to me because I'm trying very hard to leave them in the landscape, it's not that The, the leaving them in the landscape doesn't help the flower, the plant produce more flowers as far as I'm aware. I just want to kind of give them a chance to be in the landscape and see how the color plays in the rest of the bed and just kind of evaluate them. So I haven't cut any full stalks off. And so what I'm seeing is like a plant that has three, four stalks with multiple buds, a couple blooms will open the next day another set of blooms might open but the first blooms depending on our weather we have had a lot of rain sort of melts and, and needs to be deadheaded so i guess i sort of understand why people say their flowers that they don't like iris because the flowers don't last too long but if you like ephemeral type of plants like bleeding hearts and um well let's face it almost all the bulbs of spring which you have to deadhead or remove the tulips from and I don't know <laughs> that's kind of the nature of flowers to let them bloom and enjoy them and then they kind of go on their way and something else hopefully replaces it so to me they're just kind of a very fascinating flower they're also uh, really widely hybridized I think not that they're cha not challenging to hybridize because they think all kinds of breeding is difficult, but um, it's fairly, because the anatomy of the flowers is so visible, it's, it's fairly easy to collect pollen and make crosses and identify seed pods. Uh, it's something I would like to try in a few years. Uh, it's just, it's, it's a far off thing. But, um, of all the things to kind of fangirl about, I definitely have some breeders that <laughs> seedlings I find very exciting. Um, uh, and and that, that goes for really any kind of flower. Anytime I am able to meet somebody who has spent their lifetime taking a flower that they love and, and really know a lot about and developing new and more interesting and more beautiful versions of it is just, I think that's really cool. So the Shriner family has a lot of their own seedlings, as do a lot of the iris growers based all over the world, but um, there's some great ones here in the US. And I think it's important to focus on for any type of plant collection, uh, I would strongly encourage you to look to a US based field grower. Uh, that means they're growing these plants. They're growing the iris the fans they put on additional rhizomes in the summer they dig those up they split them and they send you a piece of that plant uh, it's a very different process than one of the big overseas importers who's kind of getting a massive amount of rhizomes tubers roots from the big wholesale suppliers in holland and packing them up and sending them it's not to say the plants won't grow from those dutch import tubers rhizomes etc it's just that you're getting the opportunity to support us-based floral agriculture and also you're you know you're getting what's true to name <laughs> um i'm not going to get into that we'll talk about that in my, maybe i'll recap my bulbs i didn't get a lot of the bulbs that i was supposed to this year they were labeled with what I had ordered, but they did not bloom as what I had ordered. I heard it was a really, really bad year for uh, things being mislabeled or perhaps due to shortages, people just sent out what they had. 
this is pretty. <laughs> I mean, uh, if you're new, I don't say that for head pats. I say it because um, sometimes when I'm not choosing the palette, uh, I, I don't always know how, how things are going to go. Um, but I am quite happy. I think it was a right mix of foliage. I'm glad I gave the flowers a few days to open. And I think we're going to keep having blooms. And I might sneak a couple of these tulips in just because they're pretty. And I think they'll help kind of connect this sort of honey. This has got like tan, brown, lavender, purple to it. I think the tulip would be pretty with that. So let's add a couple of those and then we'll call this done. The only thing about Vovos, well, besides the names a little, doesn't exactly roll off the tongue. They're a little short. Uh, where I planted them in like sort of mid border, thinking they would be like a parrot, like a tall parrot, uh, like a full double. And they're, they're short, so they're more of like a front of the border type of tulip. Yeah. I don't think it needs too many tulips, but just a couple help kind of pull the colors together. So Shriners, the Shriner family has a display garden. If you're in Oregon, you can get tickets to go check out their gardens and see the iris blooms and buy flowers and buy, um, I think you're probably not buying rhizomes at that point. But uh, if I were out there, I would definitely love to check it out. Maybe someday when it's safe to travel all over, I'll get to go out there and we can meet them like we did the hot haws. That's the goal of that flower grower documentary project is to meet the people that make these flowers possible. And I'm feeling like I actually, <laughs> as I stand back here, this yellow one, I really like it back here. I'm going to see if I can get one to go right here. Okay, now I think it needs one here too. So let's see what I can do. Will that fit? Probably not. Okay, so this one's a little banged up. I'm actually gonna cut it down to here and use this bloom to come out here. So that's not particularly attractive.
I think that's it. <laughs> I have a couple of the first blooms to open left and a few backups. Hey guys, it has been so long since I did a studio video that when I turned the camera off to end the overhead multicam shot, I never pressed record again to record the, so I did my outro like four times without recording it. Um, I wish I could blame it on allergy medication, but I didn't take any today. I have finished my design. I have taken some photos of it. I'm gonna take photos probably a couple times over the next couple days, which I will post probably in Instagram stories. So you can find me on Instagram at Sullivan underscore Owen. If you want to check out the Shriner family, I'll put a link to, they have a YouTube channel, their Instagram, and um, obviously their website where they have a lot of information on the different plants that they grow. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you haven't already, please subscribe during the pandemic. YouTube is my only source of income, so I really appreciate any new subscribers, likes, and you are always welcome to share the video with a flower-loving friend. So please subscribe. The cats and I really do appreciate it. All right, guys, so um, I will be back soon once I know what's going on uh, with the tree removal, redoing the potage, getting the vegetables finally planted, and hopefully at some point, I'll find some trees and shrubs for this place. Uh, but in the meantime, thank you to the Shriners for sending me their 12 stem bearded iris bouquet. I am really excited to keep cutting my own bearded iris and making arrangements this month. Uh, I just went around. It rained most of the day today, but I just did a walk and it looks like some of my tall beardeds are going to start blooming in the next week or so, which is really exciting. So thank you guys and I'll see you soon.